Okay. So, uh, system preferences. Click on the Wacom tablet part. Uh, and so this is a way you can modify how your tablet actually works. So, going back to where we were, how many of you have never worked on a graphics tablet? Okay, it's a pretty fair share of you. That's fine. Um, there's a lot that we can do in retouching that you don't need this for, but there are certain things that you absolutely have to have a tablet for. There's just no other way to do it. You can't, um, it's just things that you can't do with a mouse. So, uh, uh, if you've never worked on one before, it's 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 it becomes natural it becomes pretty easy to do there are certain things that i'm going to tell you not to do uh, using a wacom tablet um, but it's just a tool like any other tool so anyway um, to start with if you take a look at the pen part this is kind of critical there's a stylus end and an eraser end and that part actually matters um, a lot of times when people are first starting to work with these tablets they'll pick it up and they'll hold it the wrong way and then they'll actually put the eraser in down onto the tablet. And the eraser thing does, it, it functions, but it does different functions than what you expect to happen from the stylist end of it, which is the pointy end of it. If you take a look at the front uh, top edge of this uh, um, stylus, you'll also see there are two rocker switches. These actually can be used to program. They're like, uh, you can make them function like a mouse button, like a mouse down, that kind of thing. Uh, again, I don't use all of this stuff. Um, I started working with a tablet so long ago, they didn't have any of this stuff. This has all been new. So um, it's not that you need uh, these things, but I'll show you what they are and how to configure them. If you start, um, my suggestion is, is that when you first start working out with this, is you keep this as simple as you possibly can keep it. Um, you're already gonna have enough going on. So um, at any rate, um, depending on the tablet that you have, this is the one that I have. I have two different ones. This is uh, the smaller version. It's like the one that you guys have right here. For retouching, you don't need a big tablet. If you guys decide that you really love a tablet or you're going to keep doing this kind of work, um, uh, uh, um, this tablet's 70 bucks, something that's really pretty cheap. Um, it goes all the way up. Uh, Wacom actually makes... Um, tablets that are LED screens. So it's like you're really working actually on your image. So instead of having the disconnect of having a screen in front of you and a tablet that you're working on the side, you actually work directly on the screen. And they get pretty big, they, but they also get really expensive. So they can get up in the four or $5,000 range. So that's a pretty big lift for a lot of people. What I tell people about retouching though, it's very different than if you're an illustrator. If you're an illustrator in Photoshop, you need a big workspace so that you can do a big grand gesture. You can do that kind of stuff. We don't do any of that in Photoshop. We stay in a really small little confined space and do very small little repetitive movements. That's what retouching is all about. So as far as retouching goes, you don't need a big one. Um, so at any rate, just for what that's worth, you get to keep these tablets for the entire semester. So you don't need to do anything until you've had some experience with it and decide whether you like it or not. So once you get this software open at the very top, you can actually set up the way this tablet functions with different programs. So for instance, you could have it set up to work one way in, say, in, in, in Illustrator and a different way in Photoshop. Um, or you can actually have a universal way so it works the same in all applications. You can manually add these things, but they are going to get added automatically anyway, so I don't know that you really need to worry about that part of it. In the um, uh, tablet part, so you'll see there's tabs that run across the top. There's tablet pin mapping and on-screen controls. The tablet part is referring, and this will be different for different tablets. So for instance, for mine, I've got five little buttons that run across the top of my tablet. You guys, I think, have the same five buttons. You can actually configure those buttons to do different things, and that's what these express key modifiers are about. So if you take a look at the one, this is pointed at the leftmost button. If you click on the drop down menu, you can see that it is designed to do a keyboard modifier. So again, that would probably be the command key. You can change this to do anything you want. I don't use these buttons for anything. If you're into that kind of stuff, go for it. You can make them do anything you want. It's just more shit to learn and I never use it. So anyway, but that's what those are all about. 
In my case, I've also got a battery readout. I don't know that you have that on ones that are plugged into, um, uh, into your computer because it's actually running off the USB. Mine's a, a Bluetooth. It's exactly the same version as your all's, except it's Bluetooth connected, so I don't have the wire. So um, if we go to the next tab over, the pin tab, this is where things do matter and can change a little bit. So the graphs that are on the left-hand side have all to do with pressure. So these tablets are pressure sensitive and you can have the tablets do things depending on how hard you press down. Now again, my suggestion is if you are new to this, you do not want to enable pressure sensitivity because unless you really understand what's going on, all of a sudden your cursor is not actually acting the way you think it should be acting. But just to be aware of this as time goes on later. So for instance, you can use your pressure on your tablet to change the size of your brush. So when you're retouching, you can have a light touch. It'll be a very small brush. The harder you press, the bigger the brush will actually get. It's very much an acquired taste. It's a lot of experience to actually have that work well for you because otherwise it just gets frustrating. So my suggestion is to not use pressure, but we can actually look at how it's established on this. So tip feel, which is the first one, if you actually take, again, the stylus part of your brush and you put it down on your tablet and you press down, you'll see how hard you actually have to press to get what uh, Wacom feels like is 100% pressure. So again, if you, and the, pressure uh, uh, levels, the steps of levels in here is in the thousands. So if you barely tap it, you'll notice that you only get a little bit. Uh, it only comes about halfway up. If you press it even harder, it'll come all the way up. If you find that your tablet is too sensitive, you can actually click on it and actually make drag the pressure up too firm, which means you have to press considerably harder to get it to go all the way up. You can also go in the opposite direction and take it all the way down to soft, which means you barely tap it down and it'll also be 100%. My suggestion for you if you're just starting out is to keep it right in the middle. The double tap click distance has to do with how much time is in between two taps to act like a double click of a mouse. So you know with a mouse you can actually hover over an icon or let's say hover over an image or something and if you click once it just selects it. But if you double click twice, it'll actually launch that file into whatever program runs it. The difference between that is the timing in there is click distance, because you could click on the icon once, pause for two seconds, and click on it again, and that would not be considered a double click. It will not launch. It'll just reselect it. So that's what they're basically talking about here. Again, for my money, I would leave it right where it is. Oh, sorry. Unless I like selected the wrong setting. No, no, there's nothing wrong here. It's not even seeing your tablet. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna have to. Go. It, it doesn't recognize your tablet. Okay. So, well, it knows the tablet's there. Ooh, oh, it's, is there a it looks like it's a pen issue. And these pens don't have batteries in it, but my pen's actually working with this. So during the break, we'll get touch bases with Mimi and see if we can just swap out a pen for another one that's downstairs. Okay. So the things that are to the right, the two like flyout menus, this is how you can control what those rocker switches on the front of your stylist actually do. So you can see right now by default, the top switch, if you push on it, it's considered a right click, which will give you drop down menus and that sort of thing. The other one, the front switch is a scroll switch, which will actually uh, do things like um, use the, you know, your uh, scroll bars that are on the side of an image. It'll actually run through that kind of stuff. You can change those, you can modify them. So again, you can click on these and change them to whatever you want. 
I don't use these again, so that part wouldn't really matter to me. But at any rate, just know they're there. The next thing that's over is mapping. Mapping becomes really pretty important in terms of if you've got, what it's basically saying is, is that how does my tablet relate to my screen? And the reason that um, mine is actually not, yours probably says full, full. I'll show you how this one actually ends up. And so what that's basically saying, if you take your cursor and you put it onto the very top left-hand corner of your uh, tablet, it should be the top left-hand corner of your image. And the top right corner of your tablet should be the top right corner of your image. And the lower left-hand corner of your image and tablet should be the same as well as the lower right-hand side. The problem that I have with my tablet that I don't like is this behavior. It means typically when I'm working, I've got my hands actually on the tablet like this, and I'm working like this. But to get to the lower right-hand corner, I have to bring my hand off the tablet, which drops it down onto the desk. And I hate the way that feels. It just doesn't feel right to me. It's just like really confusing. It doesn't work for me at all. So you can change the mapping of your tablet to your screen, and that's what I do. So to change it, you want to go from full for your tablet area to proportion. And you'll see a dialog actually opens up. And in my case, you can actually, you'll see that there's a border around it. This is, this is going to be the live area of your tablet. I actually click mine and drag this up, the bottom part of it up. And in my case, I'm going to set the bottom at 60, well, we'll try 7,000. Basically, it's the pixel depth of it. This is in pixels. And you can see that the bottom part of my tablet is now no longer active. But that doesn't mean I lose my entire uh, uh, monitor. I keep all of my monitor. I'm just reducing the area on my tablet that corresponds to my entire monitor. Um, and I'm going to say OK to that. And now what ends up happening is, is that the bottom of my tablet is no longer down here in the corner. The bottom of my tablet is much further up. So I can keep my hand on the tablet. It's just more comfortable. There are a lot of people that will actually shrink in, especially retouchers. They'll shrink in everything so that the entire screen is literally like a like a, like like one one inch by two inch square in the very center of their tablet, um, because that means they don't have to travel far at all. Yes. Um, I don't know how you got there. Mine isn't like giving me any. So if you click this drop down menu, it's it, right now it says full, doesn't it? If you say click it down to say proportion. This one doesn't have anything, and this one has like, I don't know. Here, hang on, let me, let me slide around there really quick. It looks like it says both at the same time, like full and portion. Okay, so that part's right. That's really weird. Oh, let's uncheck force proportions. That's so weird. Anyway, it's not really going to matter a ton. Okay. You don't need to remap at all. The fact that your tablet works is really all that matters. Okay. You know, I love the idea that technology actually makes our uh, everything about us more efficient and work better. But there's times where it just dr it drags things to a screeching halt, and this is one of them. So at any rate, if you cannot do a remapping, don't worry. It's not the end of the world. For the first, I don't know, 15 years I actually worked with one of these. I never remapped anything. So at any rate, so I'm going to go ahead and say OK to that. The other thing that's nice about this is that if uh, we don't have a situation here where we can, but you'll see if I click on my screen area, this guy actually understands that you can have multiple monitors. And so a lot of people, when they're actually working with stuff like this, in a two monitor setup, they'll have all their tools on one monitor and their image that they're working on on another monitor. 
Um, again, it's just a way that if you're trying to travel across two monitors, it's not as much distance, but it's, it's, it's for you to be able to do things like that. Um, and then finally, on-screen controls. If you click on this, again, I have no idea what these things are, why anybody would want to use them. I don't use any of this stuff, so I'm just going to throw that part out to you. If we go back to mapping one more time, you'll also notice that there is two modes, at least on some of your software. Um, some Wacom tablets actually come with their own dedicated mouse, and you would just click on mouse to configure it as well. Um, but other than that, you can also click on options. And the options here will actually come up and talk about hold the pen as close to the tablet to do a right click. Again, there are just other ways to sort of um, uh, trick your tablet out. Like for me, I don't use the tablet buttons at all. I should probably just click on disable all of them, but I don't go to into any of this stuff. I just don't deal with any of it. The tablet works fine for me the way it is right here, and that's pretty much how I'm going to work with it. The pressure settings um, that you use in Photoshop are actually enabled or disabled in Photoshop, so you don't need to worry about that. We'll get to that and talk about that when we get back to Photoshop. Are there any questions about any of this stuff? All right, you can close that part up. Uh, so the next thing I want to do really quickly is show you how to submit your homework. So most of you guys have gotten pretty good at doing this already, but plug your hard drive into your computer. Come up to the Go menu. So for the people who are actually on the school's computers, you don't need to go to the Go menu. And for you guys, if you look down on the dock, there is a little cube, a white cube that's got a blue apple on top of it. If you click on that cube, it should take you to our server. For those of you who are on your laptop, uh, uh, um, uh, the Windows people, we've already gone through how you guys get on. I think everybody's been able to get onto our server. For the Apple people, again, you come up to the Go menu because you don't see library here. I'm sorry, you don't need to see library here. Come up to the Go menu, come down to connect to server and put in this AFP colon forward slash forward slash once you've already gone through all of that. Click OK. <clears throat> it will connect you to the, it should open up and say uh, you can connect to the either class projects or there's another uh, partition on there. You want to select class projects. Click on Engelhard, my last name, and inside that there will be Dropbox and you just throw your files into the Dropbox and you can see it looks like there's some people who have actually already done that. So um, uh, before the class is over at the end of the class, I will actually come back to this. You guys cannot see inside the Dropbox. You can throw files on it, but you can't open it up. You can't get in there. Um, but I'll show um, um, uh, everybody what's actually in here. But anyway, so this is where you would drop your homework from for today. Yes? Do you have um, the naming for the files somewhere? Yes. So the naming for the files, if you take a look at our uh, Canvas site, I have no idea what just happened. Uh, anyway, if you take a look at our Canvas site. Um, oh, it is a video. And actually. So I am listening to hours and hours of this video to try to figure out how to fix the printing problems that are in there. So uh, anyway, don't you guys have sympathy for me now? 
It's so dry. It's as dry as the shit that I tell you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so anyway, yeah, if you go to the top of our modules page and you click on uh, course overview, it's written right there. This is how you do the naming assignment. OK, so that's how to submit your homework. Are there questions about that? Was everybody able to get on? If for some reason, so let me just throw this out here, because people are having trouble getting the VPM to work as well. It's much better if you put your assignments in here, because then they get tagged as being on time. Uh, again, this is not going through Canvas, so these don't get time stamped. So at the end of the day today, these will go into a folder that says week number two turn in or week number three turn in. This is week number three, so week number three turn in. If your files are in there, then I know that they're on time. If they're not in there, they're late. I just, that, I just, that's how I do it. If for some reason you cannot get this thing to work or you're not on campus, you're sick, you can't get to campus, you can't get your VPN to work, so you can't do it that way, then send it to me via smash transfer. Everybody know that? So if you do, everybody take a look here. Uh, everybody just do this with me. Go online really quickly, bring up a new window, and type in from smash, all one word, dot com. And it should take you, this is a file transfer site. All you need to do is, well, if you drop a file on here, it'll give you a space to say, who do you want to send it to? And you send it to my email. It's going to ask you, who, who are you sending it? You put in your email. There's a two gigabyte limit on this. This is the free version of it. You can upgrade to the pay version. I don't know anybody who does. There's no reason. If for some reason you've got, let's say, eight gigabytes worth of files, you just need to divide it up and do four transfers of two gigabytes each to me. They just get emailed to me and I can get them that way. Please do not, in big letters, do not, do not use Dropbox, do not use Google Drive. What a pain in the ass that is. Because every time I get a file from anybody who does it in Google Drive, it says, Oh, we need to ask permission for, we need to get permission to actually download this file, which just turns what should be a 30 second affair into a three day affair. Don't use Dropbox, don't use WeTransfer, don't use Google Drive. This, the reason I use Smash is that this is the fastest file transfer service that I've ever seen. Yes. Yes. So the renaming of the assignment works like this. So I'm going to show you an example of one of the things that you would have done for today. Oh, and by the way, for those of you who are, want to figure out where this thing is, because this is now a server that's mounted onto your computer. It's, the server's name is this T-I-K-A-L. So if for some reason you lose this, oops, I really didn't want to do that. For some reason, if you lose this like this, whatever, you can come right back to that. And again, it will be on class projects. And then you can get right back to where you're going. Um, for file naming, I'm going to show you, I'm going to name one of these. So let's say that this is the file that I'm going to turn in for my assignment. So I click on it, and it would be Engelhard, my last name, underscore, underscore, verser. Underscore the assignment number. So this I'm going to say this was assignment number 2.2 The second assignment 2.1 was the first of the second week 2.2 is the second assignment of the second week. So I would do 2.2 And if there's only one assignment file due for that you're done. That's all you need to do However, that assignment has four files that you're going to turn in. There were four different things that you were supposed to do for assignment number um, 2.2. .2.
So again, you simply add another underscore and we'll say this is file number one. And then for file number two, it would be two. And for file number three, it would be three. And file number four, it would be four. So that's one way of doing it. In the multiple file setups, if you prefer, you can actually put them into a folder. So instead of doing the file naming, the, all four of them being renamed, you could just put it into one folder with your last name underscore first name underscore 2.2 and put all of the four 2.2s into the first into that folder and I'll be able to figure it out. Questions? Is that normal if the, uh, I don't have permission to the Dropbox? You can't see in the Dropbox, but it's there. So here, have you dropped it? Uh -huh. Okay, let's see if it's so there. there you cannot, the reason they don't do that is, is because if you could go in and check it, you can go in and grab hers and throw it out, which will piss you off no end. And then she'll come find you and kick, no. So that's what I said. At the very end of this, I'll show everybody. So I can see Sophie's stuff is in there. Alex, you're all right there. You're good to go. Okay. Shoot. If I want to redo it, but the name are the same, can I drop it again? Yeah, you can drop it again. I don't know if it overwrites. It may give you a warning, but you could just put in there revised or updated or use this one or send me an email and say throw away the first one. Okay. okay. Let's actually do some work today. What do you guys think? So. Yeah, yeah, again, and it, we're not going to actually be using your tablet a whole lot today anyway, so. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, see, they've updated these computers to some of these they've updated um, uh, to the latest OS, which, again, how many of you are working on the latest OS? How many of you have just uh, uh, updated to Ventura? Okay, we have just, oh, the three of you? Three of you, yeah, the three of you. So you guys are our beta testers. Thank you so much. <laughs> Word of warning, updating to the latest, greatest break shit all the time, all the time. I work two full OSs behind. So if you take a look at mine, I'm still working on Big Sur right here. I haven't touched Monterey, much less Ventura. You know why? My shit works. Yours doesn't. <laughs> that simple. You're not getting anything out of it. You're just troubleshooting shit for Apple for free. Are they paying you? God, I uh, no, right? So anyway, just word to the wise, and especially in a production environment. Oh my God, the last thing in the world you want to do. You're working on a big project. It's due tomorrow, and you do an update of your software. You have made a mistake. Anyway, just telling you how I would go about doing it. Okay, um, so anyway, like I said, let's get into Photoshop and actually do something. Um, and in Photoshop, we need to open a file. So if we go to your session three files, so session files for, or the files for session three. Inside that folder are two files that are named gradients. One is gradient, just gradients, period. The other is gradient version two. I want you to open the first one, or the one that is just gradients. If you can open that up. Again, if you double click on the title right next to the word Adobe, your screen will fill as big as it can be. If you come over and double click on the hand that's in the toolbar, your image will actually be as big as it can be without being hidden by anything underneath uh, uh, any sort of uh, any of the palettes or anything else. So this is a did everybody get this file? Okay, this is a synthetic file. I just built it in Photoshop. It's not real. It doesn't have, there's no, it, it wasn't photographed. There's no grain to it. That part doesn't exist. And that matters on some level because it has really no texture to it because again, it was just built in Photoshop. Okay, we need to talk about selection tools here. Um, so today is going to be all about selections. I'm gonna throw a little teaser out there. Um, how many people in this room, I mean, the selection tools in Photoshop have gotten somewhat okay. Um, 
but how many of you people struggle with things like hair? Yep. Well, so I'm gonna today we're gonna change that. Um, but we need a little bit of preliminary first, and that's where we're gonna start with this part right now. So um, we're gonna go through the selection tools pretty quick. Again, I'm not gonna slow down on this one, but if you miss something or you're confused about something or something's not working the way it's working on my whatever for whatever reason, shout out and just say, hey, wait a second, and we'll take care of it. Okay, so we're gonna start at the very top of the toolbar on the left-hand side. The very top icon is the move icon. That's not one of the selection tools, but the one underneath it is. It's the one that looks like the marching ant square. If you click on it and hold it down, you'll get a drop-down menu. You can do a rectangular marquee tool, an elliptical one, a single column or a single row. Those are the options that we have in here. We're gonna start with the regular marquee tool, the square one. And if you come out onto your screen, hopefully your cursor looks like a cross because you've set up your preferences right and it doesn't look like, I don't know what the, uh, what the icon is for, the, not the, the non-precision icons are, but nonetheless, if you click, hold down your mouse and drag from the top left to the lower right, it'll actually pull out a square for you. I'm gonna still hold this down, don't let go of your mouse. If you did let go of your mouse, hit Command D, that's how you do a deselect. So again, I'm gonna click and drag out again. If you add the Shift key, even at this point, it will give you a square. It will restrict your, um, uh, uh, what you're drawing to being a perfect square. And you can continue to drag off in any direction and it will still remain a square. If you let go and hit Command D, it will deselect again. If now I'm gonna hold my cursor sort of in the middle part right here, I'm gonna hold down the Option key now and click and drag. And what you'll notice now is that you, the, the selection that you are making is coming out from the center. To see what I mean a little bit better about that, I need everybody to um, turn on their rulers. You should have your rulers on the whole time and you should keep them on the whole time. So if you take a look at my screen, you see I've got a ruler across the very top and I've got another one along the left-hand side. You don't have them on the right or the bottom. To get those rulers to show, come up to the view menu and come down to rulers and just put a check mark next to rulers and then they'll be visible. If you hover over your ruler and hold down, you need to do a right click. So it's a two finger swipe or a right mouse, or if you're on a Macintosh, it is a control click. If you hold down the control key and click, you'll get a drop down menu. You can change the units that your uh, uh, image is actually showing you. And the majority of the time I work in pixels, but if you're more comfortable in working in inches, you can do that. If you are a metric person, you can do centimeters or whatever. I'm gonna leave mine on pixels. Anyway, just so that you know those exist. So the other advantage of having rulers is that this is where your guidelines come from. So if you click on your ruler on the top, just click, no, not, no modifier keys at all, click and hold down uh, 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 and drag down. It'll actually drag down a line. This is a non-printing line. All this is is a reference line for you to be able to do certain things, for you to be able to, to, to establish marks on your image that will never print, but that give you references like we're going to use right now. If you click on the ruler on the left-hand side and drag to the right, you can pull another one out. What I'm really just trying to do is establish a cross point in the middle. And now to see what I meant by that option key, if you hover your cursor right over the cross in the middle, hold down the option key and click and drag out, you will see that the center point is now, instead of the top left-hand corner or the top right-hand corner, depending on how you click and drag, this is now coming out from the center. If you add the shift key to that, you will see that it's also will give you a perfect square coming out of the center. Go ahead and do that and then let go of your mouse. Keep those little marching ants going. Your guides are, will snap to selections. So if you come back up to your uh, ruler on the very top, click and drag, go through the top uh, part of the marching ants and get close to the bottom, you'll see that it snaps to the bottom. You can click and bring down another version that'll snap to the top. You can come over to your left-hand ruler, click and drag across, and you'll get another one that snaps to the right side. 
and then another one on the left hand side, Command D to deselect. I've now got a perfect four square with a spot right in the very center of it. So things like this can actually help you do layout, work like that sort of stuff, whatever. They're just really good, smart things to have. You can change the color of these guides. So if we were right now working on a swimming pool design and uh, you couldn't see the guides because that was the color of the swimming pool, you can always go up to Photoshop, down to Preferences, down to Guides, uh, uh, Guides, Grids, and Slices. If this will open up and this cyan color right here is the color of your guide right here. You can change it in there. So in my case, I don't usually have a reason to change this. I haven't really found one. To get rid of your guides, come back up to the view menu and come down to guides and then over to clear guides. So again, take a look at my screen really quickly, up to the view menu, down to guides. Guides has got a fly out menu to the right. Come over and say clear guides and it will just get rid of them. If you hit Command Z to undo that and you bring them back, it will actually show you the guides again. It brought them back. You don't have to get rid of your guides. You can actually hide them temporarily. To do that, hold down the Command key on Mac, the Control key on Windows, and hit the letter H. The first time you do the letter H, you will get a warning thing that comes up and it says, do you want to hide extras or do you want to hide Photoshop? You want to select extras. Extras are things like guidelines, marching ants. Those things are all guidelines. There's no real reason for you to pick Command H to be hide Photoshop. It's too easy just to come up to the menu down and say hide Photoshop. So at any rate, if you hit Command H a second time, they will come back. If we click and drag out uh, another marquee selection tool, Command H will also hide the marching ants, but they're still there. Command H brings them back. And the reason I bring this up is, is that this happens to people a lot. When you first start hiding this stuff, you've still got an active selection going. So check this out. Hit Command H to hide everybody. Hit the B key to get a brush. Um, again, I use the bracket keys just to the right of the P key to control the size of my brush. The bracket key, the open bracket key just to the right of the P key makes your brush smaller, which is what I'm going to do to make mine smaller. The minute you do this, your eyes should go up to the top to the uh, uh, options bar for this tool. So this is how you control the brush tool. If we click on the number, there's the little house, there's a brush, and then there's a thing that's got a little number. This is the brush you're actually using. If you click on that drop down menu, you can actually control the size of your brush here. I don't know anybody who does that, but that's where you can do it. And then you can control the hardness of your brush as well. So if we drag the hardness all the way up, this is a 100% hard brush. It will have a very sharp uh, edge around the uh, outside of the brush. If we drag it all the way down, we have a very soft brush, so your brush will be, you know, it'll be completely opaque in the middle, but as you get to the edges, it'll fade out. You can do anything in between. A lot of times we will work with 50% hardness brushes, that kind of stuff. So it's just to sort of make you aware of what's going on in there. While we are in here, if you look underneath all of this, there is a set of predefined brushes that sit up here. These are not sticky. These are the most recent brushes that you use. And I think this is worthless. This is actually just taping, taking up valuable space. I don't use it. But at any rate, that's what it is. In the thing that's underneath it, you should have a thing that says general brushes and then dry media brushes, wet media. You should have a bunch of brushes that are actually categorized into folders. Is everybody good on this part? If you open up the general brushes in the first one, the two that we care the most about are sitting up here at the very top. And you'll see one says soft round and the next one says hard round. There's really six of them in this group that matter to us. If you scroll down uh, to the two that are underneath that, or if you want to, uh, yeah, if you just scroll down underneath that, you'll actually see that you have two more brushes, and the two next brushes are hard round and soft, um, sorry, they are soft round pressure, pressure control size. This is where you could go in. If you clicked on this brush right now, 
The pressure of your tablet would control the size of your brush. Again, I think you should avoid this stuff until you get much, much more comfortable working with a tablet. The one underneath it is a hard round brush where pressure still controls the size, so it's just the edge is the only thing changing, either soft or hard. But again, pressure controls size. And if then you go to the two that are underneath that, they're also a soft and hard brush respectively, but pressure controls the opacity, how much ink you're actually laying down. In my case, I pretty much stick with the top two, so I'm gonna actually ask you to select the second of the top two, the hard round brush. If you click on look at the flyout again, you'll just see that the hardness got set to zero. It doesn't change the size at all. Typically, I simply go into this menu and I will just change it, the hardness going back and forth in here. I don't really work with these um, uh, uh, presets uh, in this context a lot. But at any rate, back on my screen right here, I'm gonna uh, hit the D key, which will default my foreground and background colors to black and white. If you wanna flip them, well, also, you'll notice that it's not just the D key will do that. If you take a look, there's right above the foreground and background color, there's a little bitty icon that's also a black and white. That's also, you can click on that. That will also revert your colors back to black and white. So what I mean by that is, is that if we click a foreground color and let's say I'm gonna make it red, sorry. Uh, I've made it red like this. Again, the D key defaults it back to black and white. It's something that we want to get back to a lot. It's sort of the starting point. So you'll also notice in that same place, right across from the littlest possible icon in the world Photoshop could make, there is a double-headed arrow. There's an arrow that's pointing to the left and another one that's pointing down. That's how you can flip your foreground and background colors. So you can invert it so that white, your background becomes foreground, foreground becomes background. A much easier, faster way to do that is just hit the X key. No modifiers, just the X key. It'll take you back and forth. We do this all the time. So I'm gonna make white my foreground color. I've got a brush going right here and I'm gonna start painting on my screen right here and nothing happens. So then I get worried. I look up at my options and I say, well, okay, the blending mode of my brush is normal. It's 100% opacity, it's 100% flow. Why am I not painting any ink up there? Exactly, I've got a selection going that I can't see. So if you start to paint over in this other area, you can see where your selection actually is. So remember, so this is something that can really trip you up. You get a selection going, you hit Command H to hide it so that you can do some work without the marching ants bothering you. And then you forget that you've got an active selection going and you think, well, something's broken and it isn't. Make sense? Also, while we're on this, look at what happened to the selection. Selections restrict where you can paint and where you cannot paint. Now, again, that's a relatively simple concept in Photoshop, but it's really critical. The deeper we get into this stuff, the more challenging that this becomes for you, the faster you guys are gonna start forgetting all the simple shit that you already know. So at any rate, I just painted in that. If you hit Command H, you will see that it is the marching ants are still there. If you hit Command Z, it will actually get rid of what we painted. Command D will get rid of the selection and then up to the view menu and down to guides and across to clear guides and it will get rid of the guides for you as well. And we're back to where we began. Now, if something fucked up and changed and you're not back to where you began, you can always scroll up to the very top of your history and at the very top, there is a history state that is the name of this file. If you click on that, it will actually return you to what the image looked like the minute we opened it up. Everybody good on this part? Okie dokie. Yes. Is the what? Uh, we're not using it. We're not using a tablet right now. Uh, I'm just using a, either a mouse or a trackpad. Uh, okay. M key by itself is the keyboard shortcut for the marquee tool. So you can control where your actually your marquee tool lands. So how many of you guys have ever tried to do this? This is one of the hardest things there is to do in Photoshop. 
you want to select, I want you to select the entire top gradient. That's, that's going to be the goal of all of this using the marquee tool. And the problem is, is that once you get up right next to the corner to start your selection, it no longer becomes, the, the marquee tool goes away. It actually becomes the cursor again. And it's really frustrating because, and if you really get close, whatever, you're never going to get it. So here's the trick about how to get it. So watch my screen and then I'll talk you through it to do it again. So come bring your marquee tool out onto uh, anywhere. It doesn't matter where you put it on your screen because we're going to move it. Click and drag to the lower right. Continue to hold your mouse pad down, your trackpad down or your mouse button down. Hold down the space bar. This will now allow you to move this square anywhere that you want. Jam the square up into the upper left-hand corner and you'll see that as I continue to press in there, the marching ants don't go, they're all the way up into that corner. They're perfectly up into that corner. They can't go anywhere else. Let go of the space bar, it'll stay there, and then you can simply come out to, put, to do the rest of your selection. That's how you can actually move a selection around. You can't move it once you let go of the mouse. Did that work for everyone? Okay, Command D to deselect. Click and drag out one more time. <clears throat> you can actually transform selections. Now, to do this, a lot of people will actually think of, a lot of people know that the transform controls are in the edit menu. So if you come over and you look at your edit menu, you'll actually come down and you get all of these scale, transform, all of that kind of stuff. However, this applies to your image, not to your selection. Your selection is actually under the select menu. So come over to the select menu come down and you can then have a transform selection down here. When you do that, you can let go. You'll actually see that you get an anchor point in the middle and you get control handles around the outside. You can actually modify your selection now, which is an amazing thing to be able to do. Most people don't know about this. It gets even better. You can warp a selection. So to do that, if you look at the top up under your uh, options bar, there's this thing that looks, it always looks like a windshield wiper or something like to me. I don't know what the hell that thing is. But anyway, what that is, you'll get this in the transform for, Im for image as well. If you click on this, you will actually get a grid that goes on your transform right now that has not, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. It has 12 dots on it. These are all control handles. To use one, simply come over and click on one of the handles and you'll see that you can actually modify the edge of that. You can actually put in curves in there. You can modify corners. You can actually have other points that will allow you to modify a bottom. You can make incredibly complex selections. And once you get the weird shape that you're wanting to get, like I've got this one right here, if you, again, take a look up the uh, options menu, you now have four icons up there. The first one is already selected. It's the warp transform. It's the one we're using right now. The second icon moving to the right is an arrow that's going counterclockwise. What that'll do is that will actually remove the warping, but not the selection. So we'll go back to the square selection that we started with. If you go to the circle with the slash through it, it will actually deselect. You won't have any selection going at all. And then finally, the check mark makes will accept the selection. So if you click on the check mark, we've now made this incredibly odd, strange selection. And again, when you're trying to select um, things like, I mean, one of the ways to use this until you learn other tools is it's great for things like, like uh, um, uh, 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 if you wanted to select like the front of a dresser drawer or a window pane or a door or something like that. It's a great way to fine tune that and then you can actually go in and transform just that selection. So it's a way of, of tweaking a selection that you might otherwise not know about. Um, I think we rely too heavily on all the automatic selections tools. So um, that's why I'm a bit loath to do that and I always want to show this part to everyone. Hit Command D to deselect that. Click and drag out another square really quickly. And I want to do something that um, do something that covers at least part of the middle of your screen. So I want to work about intersecting selections right now. How many of you save your selections? Then that changes for everybody else. 
If you take more than two seconds to build a selection, you should save it. And if, if it only takes two seconds, you should save it. The problem in not saving a selection is that then if you need to reselect something, the chances that you will get exactly what you did the first go around are slim to non-existent. If you save a selection, you will go back and select that exact same thing perfectly every single time. Saving selections is really critical to us. So to save a selection, come up to the select menu, down to save selection, it's almost at the very bottom. A dialog box will open up, and in this dialog box, I'm just going to call this uh, Rectangle 1, or Rec 1. The only option that you've got to do right now is a new channel, so I'm going to go ahead and say OK to that. Command D to deselect. Now, if you take a look over in your channels palette, at the bottom of your channels palette are where selections are saved. So if you go all the way down to the bottom of your channels palette, you'll see that there's a new channel down there. The new channels, not the RGB ones, so the red, green, and blue are fixed there for the image, but everybody else after this, these are called alpha channels, and they're where all your selections are actually saved. So no matter how complex or what we do, it's always saved down here. If you want to load this selection again, there are two ways of doing it. I'm going to show you one, and hopefully you'll forget it right away, and then I'm going to show you a better way of doing it. But to load it again, come up to the Select menu again, and now you'll actually see that you load selection is an option for you. Go ahead and click on that, and in the drop-down menu, we've only got one, and so Rec 1 is going to be it. Click OK, and that is exactly the selection that you built and saved. So this, you don't need to worry about making exact same selections again because they're already there. Command D to deselect. A better way of doing this, and this is going to be something everybody in this room needs to master. You're going to see this in every single class from this point on. You're going to use it for every piece of your homework. But it's how to load a selection of anything. To do it, most people, well, I'm just going to tell you, this is how to do it. Hover over the thumbnail. Do not select the channel that's called Rec 1. If you pick the channel, it looks like the channel. That's what you see up here. That's not what we want to do. I do not want to pick this channel. I simply want to load this as a selection. So I'm going to go back up to the top and click on my RGB version. Scroll down to the bottom. Hover your cursor over the thumbnail, hold down the command key, it would be the control key for people on Windows. You will see that your little cursor that was a hand, they just got added a set of marching ant squares around it. If you then click once, it loads your selection for you. We have not picked this channel. Again, the RGB channel is still uh, visible to us, but this loaded the selection for us again. Makes sense? This works on everything. It works on channels, layer masks, paths, everywhere. Are we good on this part? Command D to deselect. I'm going to drag out another channel, another selection right now, and just make it a different kind of shape, but make sure it crosses over the area that your first one did. So I'm going to click and just drag out a long horizontal like log line here. And I'm going to save this selection as well up to the select menu down to Save Selection, and I'm going to call this guy Rec2, and say OK to that. Command D to deselect. You can actually control how selections, multiple selections, intersect. If you take a look at your bottom of your channels palette now, you will also see, again, another uh, uh, alpha channel has been made that's called Rec2, uh, and it's in that shape. I'm going to hover over the thumbnail of Rec 1, hold down the Command key and click to load it. Intersections, you can't do this way. If you come down and you actually just load Rec 2, what will happen is, is it will get rid of Rec 1 and Rec 2 will just, well here, you can watch. I'm going to load Rec 2 the same way. Command click and that just loads by itself. If you want to control how they interact though, you need to load, you can load a selection, it doesn't matter how you get the first one, but the second one you need to actually go back up to the select menu, down to load selection, and now you can actually say you want to load rec one, because remember I got rec number two going right now. Do you want it to be a new selection? If you pick new, it will get rid of the original selection and just give you the uh, new one. 
However, if you wanted to add it to this selection, go ahead and click on Add and say OK. And now the two of them have been put together. If you hit Command Z to undo that and take a look at the next one down, we're going to come back down to Load Selection. And this time we're going to um, subtract from a selection and click OK. And you'll see it actually cuts uh, the uh, cuts the, uh, the rec two and uh, well not in half but cuts it apart command Z to undo that and the final one again I just hit command Z to go back uh, uh, load selection and you can come down to intersect with selection and click OK and what intersect does is that what what in the result is only the area of those selections that were common to each other make sense so this stuff, controlling selections, can get incredibly complicated. I mean, you can do really complicated stuff with this. Do not blow this off as a way to actually build selections. And some content, uh, it, it works so much better than the automatic tools. OK, Command-D to deselect that. Um, I'm going to look through a little bit more, guys, and we're going to take a quick break. Um, if we take, uh, go back up to the Marquee tool, click and get a drop down and go to the Elliptical Marquee tool, come out, all the things that we just did work the exact same way. If you click and drag out, you get an ellipse. If you press up, you can get a very narrow ellipse. If you press down, you can actually invert the ellipse so that it's more like an egg standing on its end. If you add the shift key, it will actually give you a perfect circle. The same trick, I'm going to hit Command D to deselect, the same trick by holding down the Option key and clicking will allow you to do a circle from a center point. So again, instead of your cursor starting on the edge of your uh, selection, it'll start in the very middle. Uh, again, holding down the uh, Shift key will actually restrict that to a circle. If you let go to this, we can actually then do another one. And this is true of all the selection tools except for the quick selection tool. It does not work this way. However, if you take a look at the icons that sit up in the um, uh, uh, options bar that are up at the very top, you can see that this, um, there's a square, uh, a black square with a white uh, um, um, uh, center to it. And that's the thing that we're actually doing. That's how you're dealing with uh, uh, selections right now. So basically what this means is that any time that you go to do another selection, it creates, it gets rid of this one and just starts a brand new one. So if I come down here in the lower part and click and drag out, my upper one goes away. And if I, any time I do another one, so I'm not getting multiple selections here. In order to get multiple ones, I'm going to hit Command-D to deselect. I'm going to click and drag out one selection. I'm going to come away from it. You hold down the Shift key. And if you click now and drag out, you can actually draw as many of these guys as you want. You can also draw ones that overlap, and when they do overlap, you actually get the modified in shape of where this overlapped. If you hold down the Option key instead, you'll see that your cursor's got a little minus sign on it. And now when you click on your minus sign, it's a way to actually subtract from your selection. So this is another way to modify the edge of a selection. And I know people who use this all the time to make really precise selections. So you can add to get a shape. You can subtract to modify the shape. Basically, that makes sense to everybody what's going on. If you go back to the marquee one, the square one, you can actually hold down the um, um, uh, uh, shift key and click and drag out, and you can get square intersections along with your circles. If you hold down the Option key, again, you're still doing a square. You can cut a square shape out of your circle, all that kind of stuff. All of these are options for you to actually work on. Command-D to deselect. We'll get through the next tool really quickly. It'll take us only a few seconds, and then we'll be good to go. The next tool down is the lasso tool. It's there's again, if you click on the drop down, you'll get the lasso tool, the polygonal lasso tool, and the magnetic lasso tool. If you click on the top one, the lasso tool, you simply, it's a free form uh, way to draw um, uh, 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 selections. The same trick by holding down the shift key allows you to add to that selection. The same trick holding down the option key allows you to subtract from that selection. So 
doesn't it works exactly the way uh, um, the other tools work with the modifier keys uh, shift will always allow you to add more selection uh, um, uh, option will always allow you to, to subtract from that if you don't hold down any modifier key and you simply click and start a new selection it gets rid of the first one just like the other tools do command D to deselect the next tool down in the lasso group is the polygonal lasso tool in this tool, what ends up happening is, is that if you click once, it anchors your point, and then your cursor is free to move anywhere you want it to move. I'm going to bring mine up sort of towards the top, and I'm going to click and put down a second point. What this tool does is it gives you a series of straight lines. That's all it does. You can't get curved lines in here. You could if you wanted to transform them. I'll show you how to do that in a second. But at any rate, you continue to click to build any sort of shape that you want, but eventually you've got to get back to your original starting point. When you get back to your original starting point, your cursor will change and it'll give you this weird looking little icon that's telling you that it is going to complete the selection. However, uh, the other shortcut to doing it is if I simply wanted to home run from where I am right now, is if you double click really fast, it will actually finish the line that goes back to your original one no matter where you are. So this is your selection, but again, remember we can modify this selection if we want to, up to the select menu, down to transform selection, click on the windshield wiper little icon that's up in the top right hand part of the options bar, we get the, again, all of the, um, uh, uh, the grid points that allow us to actually modify the selection that we've actually got going here. So again, even though you started out with only straight lines, you can certainly change them to get to uh, horizontal lines. I'm going to get rid of that part, Command D to deselect. And the last one in this group is the magnetic lesso tool. So the magnetic lasso tool was one of the first things that Photoshop actually did that was um, a tool that was aware of the content of your image. And what this tool is really designed to do is to draw a path for you. It's, a, it's, it's more like a magnetic pen tool in the end because it's going to lay down points. If you start up in your grid up here in the very top, in the gradient here in the very top, so I'm just in the black area of the gradient, I'm going to click and I'm just going to start to drag out and you'll see that it, you get this really sort of organic line. And the reason you get this weird organic line is, is that what the magnetic lasso tool is trying to do is it's trying to locate edges. It was the first of the edge location detection tools. Not ed, there was always edge detection in Photoshop, but a tool to really leverage that. There are no edges where I just went, so it doesn't really do a good job of anything up here. I'm going to hit Command D to deselect. It doesn't get rid of that deselection. I'm going to come back to my original point so that I get an active selection. I need to get the marching ants, and then I can hit Command D to deselect. Instead, I'm going to come down and I'm going to run it right along the top edge where the red actually meets the background, meets the gradient. And if you click and you start to drag out along the line, even though you might not have a perfect hand in this, you'll notice that the line goes perfectly along there. So it's, it's even though I'm traveling up a little bit, it'll actually snap to that line. And it's simply a way to actually get that part, uh, a, a really perfect version of that line. I'm going to come all the way back again and complete that and hit Command D to deselect. Um, a lot of times, if you select these other tools, like the polygonal lasso tool or the magnetic one, you need to remember to go back to your regular lasso tool because you will be in the middle of working on something and all of a sudden you'll want to grab your lasso tool to make a selection really quick and it'll start laying down these points and then you've got to complete it and then uh, uh, get rid of only that part. It'll set you back is all I'm saying. So remember to reset your, um, uh, um, your tools. Yes. Oh, so if you hold the shift in the lasso tool, so we'll go back to the lasso tool itself. If you click, instead of dragging a point out, I'm going to click, hold down the option key, I'm sorry, uh, click, hold down the shift key, nothing happens. But again, shift is a way to add to a selection. So is that what you're asking? You can do what?
that's because you've got this selected at the top. So what Alex is saying is, in his case, he can do this. Um, he drew a shape like this, and typical behavior would be when you start to add another, to do another one, it gets rid of your first selection and only does the second one. These things, these icons up at the top, control that behavior. So if the first one is selected, it's the normal behavior. Anytime you do a new one, it gets rid of the first one. But if you click on the second one, this now allows you to do multiple ones. Look at your icon, it's got the little plus on it. If you click on the next one over, you'll notice it's got the minus icon, which allows you to get rid of selections like that. And then finally, the last one over here is intersection. So if you click here in the middle like this, only areas that are common to both are actually left. So typically, most people don't do these guys. They use the modifier keys instead. OK, I think now would be a good time for a break. Let's call this 1035. If you guys could be back at quarter till, a hard 10, that'd be great.